Okay, this will be the second video uh, looking at the history of the United States of America. Now, when you look at this country, you could teach uh, history from a deist and or satanic approach, and you'd be sort of kind of correct. Uh, you could also teach uh, history from a Christian viewpoint, and you'd be sort of kind of correct. And the reason why this is true is because uh, this country, the common people were following a great, a great revival of biblical Christianity. And at the same time, whenever you have a revival, you always have the devil building a church right next to it. And so at the same time, the new Illuminati was founded in May 1st, 1776. And so this is why in uh, American history, you could see both sides of the coin because they've been walking side by side from the start. Now, where can we trace uh, this uh, freedom of expression that we have in our country, the free exercise of religion and the free press? Where can we trace this back to, if we're honest? Now, you, I can't help somebody who's woke or cancel culture where they are willfully ignorant and lying and are dishonest about the founding documents of this country. You can't help somebody like that, a narcissistic sociopath. Uh, all you can do is just go back to the documents, and that's what I encourage to do, is because history books are nothing but second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth hand, is somebody's opinion about events of the past. And so you need to get their documents, what they actually uh, wrote in print or what people wrote down what they said. Now, the freedom in a nation is directly connected to its faith or, shall we say, religion. You see, in Matthew chapter 4, uh, verse 8 and 9, Satan tempted Jesus to bow and worship him, and then he'll give him the world kingdom. So that's religion and politics. This is why people say you're not supposed to talk about religion and politics. And the reason why is because most people's beliefs based on those are based upon emotion, symbolism, and not on substance. But how, how uh, in America... You have the woke society, and you have BLM, and you have Antifa, where they're burning American flags, and they want to defund the police and all this stuff. Where did they get the liberty to express their nonsense, their communism? Where did they get that liberty? Where did the free expression of religion or thought originate? Did it come from the Islamic faith? No, you can't do it over there. Did it come uh, from the uh, Mao Zedong? No, no. Chinese people cannot express and burn the Chinese flag there. No, no, can't do that. Where did it come from? You see, you're, the faith of the churches determines the freedom in a country, Jesus summarized it like this, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Okay, when a nation has a majority of the Islamic faith, do they have other churches allowed there? When the faith of Catholicism is in uh, control of a nation, what does that produce? Mafia? Idolatry? Dictatorships? A big, vast difference between the wealthy and the poor at the bottom, where you have very, very poor communities in a Hispanic culture. I just came back from Costa Rica, and you can see the very, very poor people in Costa Rica, but then a very, very rich, elaborate Catholic church. Hmm. When the Catholic church gets in charge... What do they normally do? Well, go back and read about the Inquisition. What began in our country? The faith of the pilgrims? 
You see, it's like a president of Argentina said as he summarized the history of uh, North and South America, where he said in North America, the pilgrims sought after God. And in South America, the explorers sought after gold. And here's an example of that if you read the testimony of uh, Christopher Columbus and what took place. Now, a lot of Americans don't like to admit, you know, where the cancel culture and the leftists will talk about Christopher Columbus and how he blah, 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 blah. Well, Christopher Columbus didn't come to this country. He landed in the Cuba area or in the Caribbean area. And if a person is honest about the history, Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain wanted Christopher to convert this new land to Catholicism. And he was motivated by gold, as he wrote in his journal. Two days after landing there, Chris wrote this. These people are very unskilled in arms. With 50 men, they could all be subjected to be, and made to do all that one wished. That's what happens when the authorities take your guns from you. And then the end result of that, the biographer, a biographer of Columbus, wrote his view of it, Samuel Morrison, and he wrote, those who fled to the mountains were hunted with hounds, and those who escaped starvation and disease took toll. Whilst thousands of the poor creatures in desperation took poison to end their miseries, so the policy and acts of Columbus for which he alone was responsible began the depopulation of Hispaniola in 1492. Of the original natives estimated by a modern uh, uh, historian at 300,000 in number, one third were killed off between 1494 and 1496. By 1508, an enumeration showed only 60,000 alive. Four years later, that number was reduced by two thirds. In 1548, there were about 500 Indians remained. Okay, now that's some history about a man who sought after gold, who tried was going to convert them to Catholicism. Compare that with the history of the pilgrims seeking after God and one man in particular by the name of Roger Williams. Now, I mentioned him in the first video. Roger Williams came to Massachusetts as a minister of the Episcopal faith. But upon further investigation of the doctrines, he soon became a dissenter, meaning he didn't comply with the Episcopal faith. And there were two ideas that he began to believe in, and one was soul liberty, the freedom to express your religious beliefs based upon your conscience. Now, that upset the Calvinist in Massachusetts, and they forced him to leave. Now, there was another belief that initially actually aided him because he said they didn't have the right to take the land from the Indians. They needed to negotiate with them and purchase it in some fashion. Now, after he fled Massachusetts and headed down to a place that eventually became Providence, Rhode Island, the Indians befriended him because they knew what he believed. 
And, and here on the screen will be the original compact of Providence, and it reads as follows. We whose names are here underwritten, being desirous to inhabit in the town of Providence, do promise to submit ourselves in active and passive obedience to all such matters, orders, or agencies as shall be made for public good of the body in an orderly way by the major consent of present inhabitants, masters of families, incorporated together into a township, and such other things whom they shall admit into the same. And then, comma, only in civil things. Okay? Only in civil things, not in religious beliefs. A free exercise of liberty. A Mr. Henry C. Vetter writes this viewpoint about the establishment of Providence, Rhode Island. He writes, thus was founded the first government in the world whose cornerstone was absolute religious liberty. He writes, it is true that a few other countries had before this and for periods more or less brief, tolerated what they regarded as heresy. But this was the first government organized on the principle of absolute liberty to all in such matters of belief and practice as did not conflict with the peace and order of society or with ordinary good morals. There's the basis, if you trace our free exercise of beliefs for the leftists to burn the flag, it traces back to a Baptist preacher. Roger Williams dissented from his Episcopal faith and was baptized by a Baptist preacher and became and it founded the very first Baptist church in the new land, Providence, Rhode Island, and there's a building there commemorating that great feat. You see, biblical Christianity is so confident in the truth of the Word of God is that it doesn't bother us when heresy is spoken. Jeremiah 23, verse 28, he wrote, The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? It doesn't bother me. I know the purpose of heresy and how it is risen. The purpose of heresy, God has a purpose for it. And that is to see how sincere people are to search the truth from the air, especially when the air looks like truth. Now here is a royal charter, a small portion or a pertinent portion of the royal charter of this colony, Rhode Island. It reads, No one in this colony shall henceforth be molested, punished, disturbed, or brought to trial on account of any differences of opinion in a matter of religion. But each one at the same time shall be able freely and lawfully to hold to his own judgment and to his own conscience in what concerns religious questions. So long as it does not violate peace and quietness and does not abuse this liberty in a licentious and profane manner. Will the state institutions with their liberty to promote their false ideas give credit to the man that laid the foundation for religious liberty? 
a dissenter of the Episcopal faith, a Baptist preacher who was so secure in his beliefs that it doesn't bother him, it doesn't matter who promotes an heir, because we know that a heresy is God's way of seeing how sincere people are. Now, there was another man back then by the name of William Penn. If you go to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and go to the Capitol building, if you go into the, walk into the Capitol building and go to the second floor, to the turn to your right, to the far right, all the way to the right, to the second floor, there's a governor's reception room. In this large room, if they're still there today, and I would assume they're still there, paints the history of Pennsylvania. William Penn. It goes a little bit back further to William Tyndale. And one of the first paintings will be Papist, burning books on a bonfire, censoring free speech, like communist and the tech companies do, and insecure little tyrants of religious uh, hierarchies who fear their heresies to be exposed. And in that painting is uh, religious books being burned, Bibles. And then another painting will be William Tyndale, the man who, I guess you can give him credit for the first English translation. The King James Bible is 90% Tyndale. William Tyndale in this painting is being burned at the stake with a caption above his head in prayer, God, please open the eyes of the King of England. God answered that prayer when King James authorized the translation work that eventually became known as the King James Bible, originally known as the authorized version. That painting is in the governor's reception room when I was there and took pictures of it. And you come around in some of the paintings and there's William Tyndale listening to an open air preacher. Why? Because the Anglicans wouldn't allow them to preach in their building. So they preached out in the open on the streets. And William Tyndale got born again, was born again as a result of that. And then William Tyndale himself became an open air preacher. And when he established the colony of Pennsylvania, he wanted to establish it with the same religious liberty that, Pens that Rhode Island had. And this seed that was planted sprouted into the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights, the free exercise of religion how did this come from from um, how did this come from Roger Williams in the 1600s to William Penn in the 1700s to 17 uh, to 1870 what is it 1787 when the Constitution and the Bill of Rights was commissioned how did this happen well in the other states or colonies like Virginia Many of the dissenting preachers suffered for not conforming to the Episcopal, Episcopal Church or the Anglican Church for preaching without a license. Augustine Esten, appearing according to his reconnaissance and it appearing that he had practiced preaching in this county as a Baptist not having a license the court adjudging to be a breach of good behavior and contrary to law. Ha! That man was arrested for that preaching without a license. Many other such preachers were doing this, and they were being arrested and jailed. And the colonists who were seeking after the truth, because many of them, if not half of the colonists, had heard George Whitfield with the Great Awakening taking place in the 1740s, 50s, and 60s, coming up to the birth of a Christian nation. And these men who were jailed, the people didn't let us stop them. They would come to the jail, this one room jail or this very small building. They would surround the jail and they'd ask the preacher to preach and he'd preach to them while in jail. James Madison witnessed 
some of these things. James Madison, one of the main authors of the Constitution, and he wrote this in a letter. That diabolical hell-conceived principle of persecution rages among some. He's referring to the dealing of five or six Baptist preachers. Now, Madison wasn't a Baptist, but he defended the Baptist in the courts throughout Virginia. In 1771, he returned home in Orange County and involved himself in the issue of the day. His attention was then absorbed by the impending struggle for independence with, with which was closely connected to Virginia, a local controversy on the subject of religious toleration. The Church of England was the established state religion in the Old Dominion, and other denominations labored under serious disabilities, and enforcement of which was rightly or wrongly characterized by them as persecution. Madison took a prominent stand in behalf of the removal of all disabilities and repeatedly appearing in court of his own county to defend Baptist nonconformist. Not only that, Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry was another man who opposed this religious persecution. And when he became the very first governor of Virginia, some Baptist people, Baptist organizations got together and wrote a letter and thanked God for Patrick Henry. Patrick Henry was sympathetic to the cause of the nonconformist. Even though he served as a Presbyterian, he still believed in liberty of conscience. And these Baptists rejoiced when he became the first governor of Virginia, the Commonwealth of Virginia. Thomas Jefferson, you know, the one that people know to be a deist, he observed a local Baptist church in his area. It was pastored by John Witherford. And, and Thomas Jefferson, though not a believer, went to this local Baptist church and he observed the polity of those churches. His sister and one aunt were Baptist. And he went and attended this small Baptist church on several occasions and watched how they conducted business. And Mr. Armitage, a man, wrote about this. It says, there was a small Baptist church which held its monthly meetings for business at a short distance from Mr. Jefferson's house. Thomas Jefferson, the main author of the Declaration of Independence at 33 years old. Amazing. It says, eight or ten years before the American Revolution, Mr. Jefferson attended these meetings for several months in succession. The pastor on one occasion asked him how he was pleased with their church government. He replied that it struck him with great force and had interested him much that he considered it the only form of true democracy then existing in the world and had concluded that it would be the best plan of government for the American colonies. Did you hear about that in your history class at school? No, I don't think so. I highly doubt you did. But the freedom that you have, the freedom that the leftists have, the freedom that the cancel culture people have, that the BLM has to burn a flag, the freedom of people like Gus Hall in the past to run for president for many years in a row, uh, meaning every time the presidency came up, every four, as a member of the U.S. Communist Party, Gus Hall quit running for office, stopped running for office when Jesse Jackson ran for president because he said, and Jesse Jackson embodies, embodies all of my beliefs. You don't have those freedoms in other countries. You only have that in this country. Taking this back... Running the roots, the seeds of this were planted by a Baptist preacher by the name of Roger Williams, extended to William Penn, influenced James Madison, the main author of the Constitution, influenced 
Thomas Jefferson, the author of the Declaration of Independence, influenced the great first governor, Patrick Henry, the man who said, give me liberty or give me death. That's why you have your freedoms, my friend. And thank God for it. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free.